Yeah, welcome to uh, lesson 14 of our study of the book of Revelation. Uh, I just want to apologize to those of you that would do the live streaming. Uh, Dan is the one that had a problem with recording for Sunday, so you're getting a, a different, probably a, a little bit of different version, but I'll try my best to uh, do this as close as possible to Sunday's lessons. But uh, just want to thank you for uh, watching them, and I just want to encourage you to continue on studying the book of Revelation. We by no means did I even cover all that's there. This is, again, as I said, type of a survey. Uh, I just uh, encourage you to sit down and try to grab some of the things that you saw, maybe they stuck out in your mind that you'd like to look at and think. Well, one of the big things that I would say, study angelology and demonology, because we see angels throughout this whole book and even these last two chapters that we're going to be looking at. I would just encourage you to uh, uh, go that route to kind of help enhance and get a better understanding of what you can. And the other thing is that uh, do your best to study it to see what the scripture says. Uh, there's a lot of things that uh, all of us, I, my, myself included, and throughout the years of uh, sitting and listening to others uh, teach the book of Revelation and different things, and sometimes some things come out that when you go back and you look for it, and it's just like, oh, I don't see that, and I don't uh, really get that. And probably one of the biggest I'll just share with you, and then we'll get started here, is, a, is one particular viewpoint uh, uh, during the millennium, which we studied last week, just real quick. It's not a whole lot in Revelation about the millennium, but one viewpoint that has been taught, I've been taught it, and others have and everything, that the New Jerusalem, which we're going to see in this lesson, is hovering in the sky, uh, and there's access back and forth. Well, that's not really scripturally taught. Uh, John Walford, who, who one that says it, but he himself says that there really isn't a verse. The only verses that you're going to have, there's two of them here in chapter 21, that the that, uh, new city, the new Jerusalem, is coming down from heaven. It does not indicate that it's been hovering above or anything like that. So there's different things that pop up over the years and uh, different viewpoints and study them. Uh, see what God's word has. And if there's not even more information given, we just have to leave it at that and not try to speculate because the speculations of teachers have created a lot of confusion in my opinion and have added a lot of things so i just encourage you to continue on doing some study i've enjoyed this as it's i've learned a lot of things so uh, again i apologize for that this being the original lesson but it's going to be kind of close and we'll just go through with it uh, we're going to be talking about the new creation uh, where we left off uh, with the great white throne judgment is that uh, uh, the new heaven and earth, they, they were gone. Uh, there was that judgment. All that were not found written in the book of life were thrown into the lake of fire, which we'll see mentioned again on these two chapters. And here we are now with the, the new creation. And we have uh, the new heaven and the new earth. And, and you're going to find... Uh, different re reasons and everything, and it's stated that because the first heaven and earth passed away there. Um, some are going to say that it's the old earth is going to be redone, made over, be new stuff. Um, I, there's different viewpoints, and people say, I'm, I'm, I'm going with this, that this is brand new. If you look in verse 5 of uh, chapter 21, it says, and he who sits on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. I, I think I think that's what it meant. This is all new. This is not going to be the world that we see right now. Uh, most definitely uh, during the millennium, we know for sure things changed. Uh, I do believe the millennial uh, world is going to be a little bit different, but it's still going to have much of much of what we have today. There'll be various things different. One, we know the, the animal kingdom uh, is not going to have that fear uh, that was there. Uh, uh, certain aspects of the curse are not, you know, real, re really relevant and, and around. Uh, uh, it's going to be 
close to paradise, but it won't be paradise. What we're talking about now is paradise. And so I'm just going to leave with it that it's a new heaven and it's a new earth. And it's because the first heaven and earth have passed away. One thing stated here in these beginning verses is a no longer any sea. And it's a question that you can ask. It was in, in the class and even on my own with my wife and myself, we were talking about this, that the sea is beautiful and everything. And I'm just going to share with some of the commentators. If you go through scripture, you'll see, you know, sometimes the sea is portrayed as a as evil with the depths. And even here, this is where we have the sea, um, excuse me, the beast comes out of the sea. And so uh, I, I don't know if that's it. And when I say no longer sea, that is meaning no longer oceans. I, the last time, a couple lessons down, we talked somewhat, I think, in the, it's talking about the salt water content, not just like the Mediterranean Sea. I, th I do believe this means salt water. You know, three quarters of our earth is covered with that. And which that means is, is that that's, you know, we have the aquatic life and everything, but we don't have the living space for, for humans and everything. And so there will be water. We'll see that as we come on. But we see that. And then I showed that there's no more death mourning, weeping, pain, curse, and night. These are the other things that, that will not be present during at this with this new heaven and this new earth and as we see it. Uh, and in these opening verses, and this is the first verses are very, uh, they get expand out as we move along here. And uh, John writes down that to, as he's told to write and He's told that these words are faithful and true. He says, uh, the new Jerusalem is coming down. Uh, this is that city that uh, Abraham was looking for, the one that's uh, not made with uh, hands uh, of man, but by God and everything. And it's specifically stated as God's dwelling place. And this directs it to that idea of the Old Testament. That was that whole thing about the tabernacle and then going to the tent is that God is among men. Well, we're now in this new world and this is possible. I mean, it, it's going to, to work completely in a awesome way. And Christ said, as I mentioned already in verse 5, I'm making everything new. And I give you some Old Testament verses that talk about that. And, and John's told, write this down. These are faithful and true words. This is, this is God's word and everything. And you notice that there's a promise to the overcomer. Uh, there in verse, verse 4, it says that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. And these will no longer be any mourning. But did you notice in the next uh, verse, um, the next verse uh, there is that you'll see uh, later on, uh, verse 8, uh, but for the cowardly and the unbelieving, we've gone from the promise to the overcomer. Also, verse 7, he who overcomes will inherit these things. This this new world, this new, new heaven, new earth, this new Jerusalem are going to be inherited by the overcomers. And we saw that in chapters 2 and 3. Uh, but then in verse 8, and this will be the first of, of three of these type of lists uh, talking about uh, those that won't be overcomers. And verse 8 says, But for the cowardly and the unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and adulterers and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death. And starting with this list, and there'll be two more lists we're going to see, the whole idea is John is using things that we understand. And he's using words and uh, that you and I understand, those first century people, that those seven churches that this letter is initially written to, and now it's, it's for us in the 21st century, is that none of this will show up in the new heaven and new earth. You have to be an overcomer to be here. Uh, yes, he's going to mention them uh, when you read that. It says, and then later on, it's going to even make you ask more questions. But he's just stating that, no, that's gone. That will not be in this new heaven and new earth at all. 
then he goes on and he moves, he starts talking about the holy city. And we have a, an angel guide here uh, that comes up in verse 9. And it's one of the seven uh, angels with bold judgments. Um, no names are given. Uh, no speculation. This is one that we're just told it's one of those angels. Obviously an angel of high rank and everything. And I do believe that the angels had ranking and everything uh, taking place. And he's going to be the one that uh, will show uh, the city to uh, John. And here it's referenced as the, the bride and the wife of the lamb. We're now talking about the city. Um, I don't want to get too deep and you can study and everything. Uh, yes, the church is called uh, the bride of Christ. Uh, that's most definitely. But here we're getting a little bit expanded view. We're talking about the, this city and yeah, the church will be dwelling there. And so don't get too too hung up that this is just a church. It's not. We're talking about the holy city. A, a literal city is being talked about. And actually, John, you'll, you'll see as we start going through the description here, he's on this high mountain so that he can see it and get this view of it as it's coming down because this is a big city. Uh, the next verse is it kind of gives some of the physical features of the city. I'm just going to briefly go through them. There's a lot there and some things. I'm just going to kind of do point out some of the things. And the one big thing is its brilliance, uh, the, the, this this brightness and everything. And in fact, I was just kind of thinking about that today, and we kind of mentioned something in class and everything. But you know, the sun shining and everything uh, that that's really is kind of therapeutic and everything. And you always talk about you know it's it's dark and it's gloomy and everything. And I know my brother-in-law lives up in Alaska. The one place where he used to live, it would get the six months of darkness. And he uh, worked with the EMT and it just uh, wasn't good on the people to have that, that darkness. I mean, the sun would just hang on the horizon and everything. Here we have this brilliance and it's talking about the glory of God, that Shekinah glory that we saw in the Old Testament. You'll see as as you go through there. And one of the general appearances that he gives there in verse 11 is talking about it's Jasper. And that word is used in uh, chapter four, verse three, talking about God. It's a, it's a, a aspect of talking about the brilliance and, and the glory of God and everything. And so that's a general appearance that's given there. And then he goes on and he talks about, as I said, I'm just gonna be kind of brief and you can go back and uh, look at that and everything. Uh, the walls, uh, it's going to have these walls and these gates and a foundation. Uh, the measurements that are given are just phenomenal. But, but but these gates, first of all, these gates are called tower gates. I'm trying to think. I, I can't. Um, I'm quite sure if you look at some of the castles of England or of Europe and everything where the gates are, then you have a tower. And that's kind of the idea here is that there's going to be 12. And these twelve gates have the names of the twelve tribe, tri the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel, and by these gates are twelve angels. And then you're also going to see that these gates are are, are made of, uh, of of pearls, each individual gate. And I, I did not know this, but uh, actually pearls are more of a prized possession for the ancients. And part of the reason is is that because it, it, it's a it's a luxury item or we want to call this a it's an item that requires no manipulation to bring out its beauty um, as a diamond when you get a diamond uh, diamonds have to be cut um, you, they, they'll find these big huge diamonds of massive carrot and everything but they ultimately have to be cut now uh, the aspect of of diamonds is that they have all these very distinct lines and everything and then once they're cut and they're shaped and everything there's its brilliance and its beauty and everything and uh here i uh, pearls uh, they that's it you don't have to do anything to them in fact i didn't realize that the caesar uh was given the idea that uh, uh britain had lots of pearls and that was part of the reason uh, heading up and conquering Britain is to get the pearls because of uh, the great possessions there. Right? And that's just something we can't, I can't fathom. A whole gate is made of a pearl. And, and on top of this whole idea is, is that, that all these gates, these 12 gates, 
which are around all the sides of this, they're all open. They're always open. Uh, don't get locked in and says, wait a second, we have this, this city with walls and with gates. The first thing we'll think of is, is again, I just already mentioned the castles of, uh, of Europe and everything. And at night, they always closed the gates. Uh, they barred them, always had someone to protect them. And the walls were to keep people out. That's what the Babylon was. was Belteshazzar thought they wouldn't be... Um, uh, excuse me, Belshazzar. I get confused with those two names. Belshazzar, you know, thought we were protected and safe. Close the gates. We have these six walls. Uh, uh, they won't be able to come in. They just, he forgot about uh, shutting the water supply off and coming underneath the walls. That's not what these walls are about. These walls are, these walls are of this city, the way God built it and everything. And it's just a massive city. Gates are open all the time. Uh, they're never closed. Um, the foundations, there, there's 12 foundations, uh, and they have the names of the apostles of the lambs. And I just want to point out, uh, the gates have the names of uh, the tribes of uh, the sons of Israel, and the foundations have the names of the apostles of the Lamb of Christ. Um, the names aren't mentioned. That's because that's not the significant aspect that's being talked about here. And we're talking about Israel when we're talking about the church. And it's a very, very interesting. We, these are two aspects. We're not talking about individual names and everything. But we, the, And this is a good point. The, the church and Israel are two separate entities. Always have been, always will be. And this is one of those aspects. Um, we hit, so we have that 12 is a big number that goes working through there. So you have the gates and the foundations and these walls. And then the measurements are given out there. And, and a golden rod is used. And the idea of it, the rod being gold, is because this is an awesome building. This is an awesome thing made with the hands of God. So we're going to use something that is of extreme value. So that's why the golden rod. And it is a square, or if you wouldn't want to call it a cube, but it's the 15 mile, 1500 miles uh, as a set in class. That, uh, that's one direction would be from the border of Canada to the Gulf of Mexico, roughly, and then from the East Coast to the Mississippi River, and then put that into a square, and then, and then the walls go up 1500 miles. Uh, the only way I can give you an idea of what that might mean is, first of all, the International Space Station, uh, its altitude is 254 miles. Um, uh, the Starlink uh, satellites out there for communications, they're running around 341 miles up. And at 62 miles, that's, it's, that's the point where Regular planes can't fly above that because the air is so thin. So it gives you a mile. Uh, you go beyond that. We're going into outer space. And so I'm just going to say, based on the size of the city that's coming down to the Earth, this Earth is not the same Earth. There's no reason why we can't have a bigger Earth than what we are living on now. This is just, it's new and it's just, it's going to be phenomenal. And then the last verses, there's 1821, are these special features. And, and the one thing I pointed out there is that pure gold, like clear glass, we don't know what that is. Uh, pure gold, if you take a ring, uh, make it a pure gold, it's, it's malleable. It, it will wear out um, rings of, uh, older rings that have more gold content wear out real quick. We don't understand what this means. This is this is something precious and way beyond our comprehension. This is the best way John could describe it. He's using his words, his understanding of the things he's seen, and that's how he's describing it there. And so we have these, these the city is just, and it's brilliant because those gates are those, excuse me, those foundations. The stones that I'm not even going to go through, you have whites and yellows and blues and reds and greens. It's just a phenomenal beauty that we don't know. And as I said in class, don't let be fooled by anybody that's written a book, said they died and went to heaven and came back and wrote a book. No, they didn't. In fact, the heaven they went to is 
the old heaven. And so when you, they can't, even if they did went to heaven, wouldn't be here. But the, the descriptions that people give don't even match. There's nothing there. And this city, this new heaven, this new new earth and this city coming out, just phenomenal. We just, we, we can't comprehend it. As we go on and look at it, the city's illumination now we, we look at it and it says the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb, they are the city's temple. No more temples. This is it. Uh, had that millennial temple uh, was built and it was phenomenal and I'm not sure exactly how that all transpired, but it was a much bigger uh, temple than uh, any of the other temples that are around, but there there is no need. And this is the emphasis here is the presence of God with men. Um, we'll see. I, I think I've already stated it. There is no curse. You remove the curse. Fellowship with God is available. Uh, this is the presence of God. And again, this repeat, there's, there's no need for light. And in this aspect, so no sooner sun or moon. And so those celestial things, again, what's, what goes beyond this? I have no idea. It just says the glory of God illuminates it, and the Lamb is its lamp. Please remember, as we started this going from chapter 1 all the way through, we have the Trinity. We have, and we have most definitely, Jesus Christ is God. There is, there's no if and buts about it. Anybody that teaches otherwise is a false teacher. And saying that the New Testament Christ never said he was God, yes, he did. And it just continues on. We just see the Trinity throughout here. And it talks about that the, the nations will walk by its light. And I, I will be very honest here. Uh, we're going to see the kings and the nations and going out of the city. And I'm not really sure who these people are. Um, this could be, and we talked about this in class, uh, because there's another passage that we can look at and see and everything is that we have this it's just the people that came out of the millennium and i'm just going to hold with that i don't know how all that works that at the end of the millennium there are the saved people the ones that don't align themselves with satan when he uh is let loose um i don't know i i it's a different group of people i'm just going to go with that but they're they're believers it doesn't matter their names are in the book of of, of life, and it's, you don't have to worry anything about that. And then verse 27, this is a second list. Uh, this is a note. Reader, take, take note of this. In verse 27, and it says, And nothing unclean, no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Uh, this is for the readers. And that's why I said that. Reader, take note of this. This is not at all saying that in this new heaven and new earth, you know, outside the city, we're going to have sinners. We're going to have uh, people that uh, practice uh, these things. No, uh, this is just, again, another point. The only way to get to this point is that you have to have your name written in. The Lamb's Book of Life. You have to be a believer. You have to believe in Jesus Christ as as God, as the one who died on the cross. He shed his blood for my sins, took the punishment for my sins, and then he rose again. And he's the, the first fruits of the resurrection. He is the first resurrection. And he makes it possible that we can get back into this fellowship so that we can have the presence of God. So uh, don't take that verse as meaning that, oh, we're still going to have sinners. No, it's just to help. These are, again, terms and things that you and I would understand. Uh, we know about all this stuff. It's the same. There will not be any sin in this new heaven and this new earth. This, this whole economy is sin-free. I'll uh, continue on to look at the, the city and talking about the inner life of the, the city. And the, the, the angel shows a new aspect of the city. He's talking about a river. And he said it's called the water of life. And uh, that should make us think immediately of Christ at the well uh, with the, a woman of Samaria and everything. And it's crystal clear. It's just like, I don't know if you've ever been in the Rocky Mountains or any of those areas and seen uh, the melting snow 
water coming down over the rocks and everything. It just has a glistening. This is a clear and everything. This one flows from the throne of God and the Lamb. Again, note, God and the Lamb. And the throne is singular, but we have God and the Lamb. And a question came up. And I, this is a triune God. I can't explain it. Um, we're going to see, as you've already seen the notes, we'll see his face. Moses spoke to God face to face, but it was brought up that uh, no one can see God because he is a spirit. Christ is God, and so I can't under explain the whole thing. I just know it's there. We have the tree of life. Tree of life, boom, takes us right back to uh, the book of Genesis, and we see that that tree there. It's a special aspect of the garden. We are now back into paradise the way it should be. No sin, no curse, and we have this this living water. Uh, we have no need of a temple because it's it's the Father, it's the Son, and the Holy Spirit are there. We have this tree of life, and again, I can't explain the picture they have here. It's talking about this river flows down the middle of the of the street. Uh, also, the idea this isn't a humongous river. It's kind of I'm not really sure how you would explain, it, but it's small. But it says. Uh, the tree of life is there, and a lot of them would say that, you know, it's a row of trees on both sides. I don't know. Uh, it's singular form, tree of life, but maybe, uh, with, I didn't say this in class, but I started thinking, like, maybe it's kind of like, I don't know if you know anything about Rosa Sharon's, but they uh, used to have them in our old place, and they kind of drove me crazy because the shoots popped up all over the place. I don't know if that's the idea here, but we're going to have these 12 fruit or 12 kinds of fruit that come out every month and it's going to have leaves for healing of the nations again i don't understand i will be honest what does that mean because there is no sin there is no death um one of the aspects that was given to that word healing the greek word is where we get therapeutic from um it, it, it's just showing us that God's promises have come to being and there is no need for healing. I, I, I really don't know. I think we'll be able to eat the fruit. I don't think. But the idea does not mean that there's people being sick, people getting hurt, and they need healing. I, it, it, it's not that idea that they're how it's going to work. And again, you see the healing of the nations. And one commentator suggested that this is for those that came out of the millennium. They went from the millennium to the new heaven, new earth. I'm just going to throw this out. You need to think about that. How did that all work? Yes, I know there are people in the millennium. I know people went from the tribulation into the millennium. They were all saved people. And they started having children. Is there death in the millennium? I can't answer that because there's longevity. Isaiah makes a comment, if someone dies at 100, there's something wrong. I, 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 that suggests, all that suggests is that there's longevity. Maybe they'll live a thousand years, those that come in. And you're going to have ones that are born and everything. But there are going to be ones that, that when Satan's released, that they are going to rebel. And they're unsaved. Now, they're going to go to the lake of fire. The other ones coming to the presence of God. So I, I, I don't know what the need is. I, again, think about it. It was said that if Adam and Eve ate of the tree of life uh, after they sinned and then they ate the tree, they would live forever. Um, I don't know what the aspect is here, but I know it's there. I know what it's telling me is, uh, as a believer is that we're back to paradise. And we just have this tree of life that, that is there. And then the next thing, there's no curse. Absolutely no hindrance to the fellowship with God. So that's why I'm not sure exactly what's going on about that healing aspect. But I know the fruits. I just know it's telling me that I don't have to worry about sin. Uh, that's Genesis 3, when the curse came, it no longer exists. That broke the fellowship. You notice when it happened there, uh, the fellowship was broken. They hid themselves. It's not going to be there. And then we're going to see, again, that the throne of the of God and the Lamb. And then we have the bond servants will serve and continue. What the service is, who knows? doesn't matter. It's going to be glorious. And it says we'll see his face and the name of his on his foreheads. And here's the thing to think about the name stuff or whatever you want to do. 
we're going to be in this constant brilliance of God. And when Moses was in the presence of that brilliance, when he walked away, he shined too. But it's not going to matter because we're all going to be in it. And again, it just repeats. No need of light. No need. He is the light. God is the light. And then it states there at the end, it says, we'll reign forever and ever. And this reigning, uh, a lot of commentators will take this reigning aspect, and it's part of um, uh, part of the rewards um, that will be given out the Bema Seat. We didn't really talk a whole lot about the Bema Seat uh, taking place in heaven while the tribulation's going on, but that's where I would place it. And rewards are given uh, there. It's not a judgment for our sins that's taken care of uh, at the cross. Uh, it's just what we are doing right now. How are we ministering and serving our Savior now with the gifts that he's given to us? Uh, the rewards be that. And a lot of commentators think that's some type of reigning, some type of uh, aspect there. Right? But it's going to be forever. Right? That's, that's that whole idea. It's forever. Uh, the epilogue, the final words, uh, starts off with the testimony of the angel. And we find in these uh, two verses here that kind of brings out four distinct features of the, of the whole revelation, the whole book of Revelation, this, this revealing uh, that Jesus has given to us of, of what's going to be taking place and everything. And um, uh, first of all, Again, we see angels. We have the 12 angels at the gates, and we've had angels through here. We have the angel guide for uh, John, and now we have this angel sanctions the, the truthfulness of this book. And then we have an angelic affirmation that God, as the inspirer of prophecy, and it's been revealed to his uh, uh, servants, and it's going to happen shortly. It's going to happen in God's timing. Um, it won't happen any sooner or any later, but it's it's shortly. And this uh, an angel confirms this and everything. And then we see Christ's assurance that the central promise of the Lord coming is about to be fulfilled. He is coming. He is coming. And then we have a, a beatitude there. Uh, we see um, uh, in this aspect on verse 7, uh, it says, And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. This is the whole thing about this book. We're supposed to be reading it and studying it. It's not a mystery. It's not something um, that only certain people can study. This is meant for every believer to read through. It's a revelation. As I said in chapter 1, and you look in those first verses, it's not just it's for readers. And the readers and the hearers are going to be blessed. And go through this book, chapters 2 and 3, particularly in the church, tells us things we need to watch out for, things that we need to correct, things we need to stop doing. And then we also need to go that this stuff is going to take place. We need to forewarn those during this church age that you and I are in. We need to be forewarned. These things are going to happen. This seven weeks of horrific things is coming, coming to be. It's going to take place. And we need to tell... And it's there's two kinds of people saved and unsaved the saved are here in the new heaven and new earth the unsaved will be ultimately in the lake of fire which is unspeakable torment I, and we're only given viewpoints if you read throughout scripture and learn about uh, hell and and things that christ says about hell and where uh, it just it's a physical torment it's a mental torment it's a spiritual torment uh it just goes beyond and it's not going to be as as many a times i've heard in my own lifetime people say you know it's going to be a party it doesn't matter we're all going to be there or i'm going to be there with people i know blah 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 uh, no it's that is not and what's worse yet hell is not or well, the lake of fire neither one of those are the domains of satan Satan's going to be in the lake of fire along with the beast and the false prophets being tortured. Uh, it's not. And so this beatitude we have here in verse 7, it says that we need to read this and study it. Blessed are those that do it. And then we have verses 8 through 11, John's testimony 
uh, about uh, what's going on. He says, I, John, this is the human guarantee. He does this in uh, John 19.35, and uh, we see it in First John. Uh, we have his guarantee. He's a witness. I just can't imagine. You know, God chose him just like Daniel was chosen for the things he did. Joseph was chosen, and these men of God are just phenomenal things they got to experience, and he shares us with us. He says he heard and he saw. It's the ears and the eyes, uh, means and vehicles that we know about. Now, we just have this real quick little thing. John falls down to worship because of this expand. I, I, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, John, I think, just a human being. He just was an, the awe-inspiring things that he sees going on. He, you know, one commentator says that he got confused that this angel was Christ, and that's why he fell at his feet. But it doesn't matter. We have this awesome uh, heavenly being talking to him, and and this angel tells him, well, we'll go, don't do that. He says, I'm a fellow servant of you and your brethren, the prophets. In other words, there's this this closeness uh, uh, that of what the angels do and what John and his brothers as a prophet, which is, is the testimony that John is a true prophet. And then he adds on to, and those who keep the words of this book. There's our responsibility. There's where we're connected into. We're, we're actually connected with the fellow servants of the angels. And it's it, once straight, worship God. That's what needs to be done, what needs to take place. Then he says, you know, do not seal the book up. Uh, it, it's for all to read. The time is near. It's just a, a very important thing to, uh, to aspect to see. And then, and then he gives a warning. Don't reject these prophecies. Um, that's what verse 11 really means. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. The one who is filthy still be filthy. And let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness. And the one who is holy still keeping himself holy. Uh, the idea is for us to get the picture. Um, the only way to get the new heaven and the new earth is that we have to be believers. We have to be uh, believing and saved by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, it's just an aspect that if the finality is, is if you reject Christ and you die, that's it. Uh, it's, it's, it's final. And so that is a warning to the readers. The warning is don't reject these prophecies. And you may say, okay, the readers are the seven churches, uh, and then it goes beyond that. Uh, if you read through those letters, you can notice very easily that within those churches that you're writing to, there are people that were not saved. They were professing Christians, but they truly were not saved. And that's how we find churches throughout the ages, all the way up to the 21st century, all the way up to 2020. There are people in the church, they come and faithful, they're moral, but they're not truly saved. And it's a warning to them not to reject these prophecies, the things that are, are coming as you come on, we have the testimony of Jesus uh, here in these remaining uh, verses coming to the end. Uh, he says, Behold, again he says, I am coming soon. Um, his, it's his timing. And I, I apologize, I just read earlier today on Habakkuk, and, and Christ is telling Habakkuk about the coming of the Babylonians. And he tells them, There will be no delay, he will come. In my time and that's this whole aspect of all the stuff going on it's God's timing there is no delay it's been 2,000 years since this has been written he is coming soon Christ came just at the right time the first advent what we're coming into this the season to 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 look at the 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 incarnation I said it was just the right time there is no delay there is no, nothing shortened, nothing stretched. It was exactly at the right time. That's the same aspect all the way to the end, this last book. I am coming soon. It's going to take place. And he says he's coming as a rewarder here. And we have this positive, negative aspect that, that's being said here. And says, the reward that it belongs to me to give. He has the authority 
to be giving out these rewards. And he uses that term, every man. This is individual responsibilities, no way, shape, or form can we a, a, accuse a group of people. Respond. No, this is every person is responsible for their actions. He's qualified. And there in verse 13, three titles are, are given to him. Again, they're, they're repeats of things you've already seen from chapter 1 and throughout the, the book of titles given to Christ, which makes him God with these titles. And blessed are those. This is the last beatitude of the book uh, that you'll you'll see here and everything. And it, it's it's talking about repented sinners. Those are the terms, those who washed their robes are white. That's repentance of your sins. And he's talking about the believers in Jesus Christ. And have a right to the tree of life. That's the same thing that was said in uh, chapter 2, verse 7. Is talking about the, uh, the same thing that's going on there. Uh, is that uh, that promise that is there. And we have, again, this, this last list in verse 15. And it says, outside the holy city, outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practice light. Again, this is not talking that it's outside here on this new heaven and the new earth. What this is talking about, this outside, is the, is the lake of fire. Now, the curse is gone, so therefore sin is not here, and no sin can be in the presence of God anyways. And he's now put himself where he's he's on the throne, in the city, he's the temple. No way can sin even be around. The gates are open. Freely the people come and go through the city. So the idea of outside the holy city here means that place, wherever the, uh, the lake of fire is, I, I, it's somewhere. Uh, it is a real place. It will be a real place. It, it will have all those people, again, not written in the book of life or the Lamb's book of life. If their names aren't there, that's where they'll be. They rejected Jesus Christ. And that's where they'll be. And that's what it's talking about. And at just one point, this is the, the third list that I, I've read there. And if you notice, all, all three lists has lying. Uh, seems to be one of our biggest things that we're really good at is that the human nature the sin sin nature that uh, we, we can lie and that's what we saw in the garden and that's what what satan did he lied uh, he lied right there and the lying has gone all the way through there will that's gone um, their destiny is the lake of fire and then he says i jesus and what this what he says there in that verse is He's the Messiah. Uh, he, he, he let us know, as he says, Jesus, that that's human. He is that God-man that started out to reign in the millennial and it just continues on. But he has, a, he has the authority in that bright morning star. I, I just put there the perfect day of God. That, that's one sunrise that never will set again. It's almost a kind of picture that's how I'm putting it there and everything with that bright morning stars. I, he, it, it's there, it starts, and it goes for eternity. And then we have these kind of these petitions. Uh, I think the words are coming from Christ, but he's repeating what the bride and what the spirit has said, and it's come. Um, come. It, please come. And then we have uh, at, at verse 19 there, Actually, let me go back to verse 18. I'll, I'll start you there. Verse 18 says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in the book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of its prophecy, God will take away from his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. <laughs> Prophecies closed. The revelation's been given. There are no more prophecies that are coming. You can't 
add in Deuteronomy talks about the same thing about adding and taking away. Uh, that's in teaching. It's changing something in your teaching. Say, so, well, yes, that's there, but that's not really relevant today. Uh, that doesn't hold to this culture. And like, no, uh, it, there are no more prophecies. God's word, not just here in the book of Revelation. It's the last book. And that's really the whole idea is that it's closed. And no one can add to it. No one can take away from it. And it's it's a deep warning as it's being stated here and everything. And so it's just a very, very critical thing. I, this is God's word. When you're blessed, when you read and you practice, we're told in chapter one, and we've already been told again uh, about uh, the blessedness of being in this book, which tells me this is not a, a mystical, a difficult book. A difficult beyond comprehension. Let me put it. It's difficult, most assuredly. Uh, but it requires some studying and requires also hitting the point. So we're not given a full answer. But guess what? As a believer today, uh, if I die, I'm absent and present with the Lord. Uh, then at the rapture, I'll get my new body, or if I'm alive when the rapture takes place, I get the new body. I'm not going through any of this stuff, but we need to talk to those around us so they too do not go through this because it's going to happen. The final, final words, kind of stretching that out. And Christ says, yes, I am coming quickly. Um, I put Second Peter 3, verses 11 through 18 there. I put those there because um, that's how we're supposed to live. Read those over and study them. That's what we are to be doing now, being diligently living like Christ, obedient to his word, loving one another, but first of all, loving God with our whole being. Uh, he's coming quickly. Uh, again, we... We can't fall into this idea he hasn't showed up. Therefore, we can do whatever we want. And then when it's coming close, there's too many parables that Christ gave that said that doesn't work that way. This is the same thing. This is going to happen. It's going to take place. And then John says, he says, amen. This is absolute faith in Jesus' promise. And he says, come. Come, Lord Jesus. Again, it's one more proclamation of his deity. He is God. And he died for my sins, took my punishment so that I could be in fellowship with the Heavenly Father. It's something that should grab us and we should hold on to and we should pass on to those around us. Then we have the benediction, that last verse there. Last verse 21 it says, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. And then then we have one more amen. It's God's grace. It, it, it is his provision. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's his grace. It's the only way to be saved. It's the only way. It's by God. And he fins, ends up this book, this letter that goes to these seven churches. And then it spreads out and comes to us today. Uh, it's a book to be studied. These things are going to take place. There is a finality. Uh, if you do not accept Jesus Christ as your Savior now, the eternity is terrible. It's just beyond belief. And as believers, we need to be shoring up our attitudes, our actions, our words, uh, particularly in these difficult times. There have been worse times and there may be coming worse than what we're even talking about. We need to live for Christ. We need to proclaim him to others in our words and our actions each and every day and honor our God and our Lord and our Savior. I just thank you for your time, let's have a word of prayer. Father, I just thank you again that we can be in your word. And I just thank you for the opportunity to be able to teach and to be able to uh, 
look into it and we just, I just ask that you be with those that uh, are listening that you would uh, help them to further their study help them uh, just each and every day I some may be sick and we just have a variety of people right now that are sick in the church and the school and even family members we have we just pray for them father help us that we will be doers of your word that we will go and tell others uh, especially during these times it, uh, because what you said is coming to be it will happen these are true and faithful words and as with john i say come in jesus name amen